So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wednesday morning at MIPIM and to our Manchester stand. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here this morning for our conversation about cities shaped by airports. Uh, in this city debate, we'll be looking at the issues that are uh, related to how airports connect cities, how the areas around airports become important development zones, how industries that are related to aviation can help to develop an urban economy, but also how the positioning of airports and their connectivity can shape the whole geography of a metropolitan area and change the development and investment opportunities that they have. We've got an absolutely stellar uh, panel with us here this morning, and I'm going to introduce them to you now. Firstly, on, on the far right of the panel, Sir Richard Lees, the leader of the city of Manchester. Next to Sir Richard, Anna Gisler, the chief executive of Invest Stockholm, the inward investment agency of the city of Stockholm. Next to her, Oivind Satvet, the managing director of the Oslo Regional Alliance, the alliance of local governments in the Oslo region. And next to him, Adam Elzakali. He's the deputy mayor from the Amsterdam metropolitan area and deputy mayor of Haarlemmeer, the municipality that hosts the airport at Schiphol. Sitting next to Adam is Linda Schillor, chief executive of the Manchester Airport Group Property Division. Please welcome our esteemed panel. So Richard's going to begin the discussion about airports and cities and then from there uh, we'll introduce each of the speakers and in the normal way we'll try to develop a, a debate and I'll be inviting all of you to participate. So Richard. Uh, good morning uh, everybody. I, I, I think Greg we're going to swap places tomorrow morning so that you can then describe me as being on the far left yeah. rather, than on the <laughs> rather than on the far right which I'll be far more comfortable <laughs> with. So uh, uh, yeah so uh, We'll bear that in mind uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, Airport City because Linda uh, is. I'm going to talk uh, a few comments more generally about uh, airports. The, the late Peter Hall, uh, planning professor at uh, uh, London School of Economics, actually from the northwest, I think, is from uh, uh, Blackpool, I think, uh, uh, originally, said that you needed two things to grow an economy. You needed a university and an airport. Uh, clearly, that, that's a, a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that basically say modern economies are built around knowledge and skills, that's the university half of it, and about connectivity, the airport uh, uh, half of it. And increasingly, for a modern economy, for a, a modern city, it's about international connectivity. And clearly, for international connectivity, we are talking about air travel. There, there are clearly uh, issues around uh, air travel, around the sustainability. If you happen to live next to a, uh, an airport and you have your house triple glazed because there tends to be a little bit of uh, noise. But as aviation grows and we need it to grow in order to grow our economy, those issues are actually reducing rather than uh, increasing. Uh, planes are becoming far more fuel efficient, as much driven by the market as, a, as anything else, that uh, in terms of re reducing the cost to operators of aviation, and modern planes are getting a lot quieter uh, as well. And I think we, it does mean that we can grow aviation in a sustainable uh, way. So it means for Manchester Airport, and apart from its impact on the Manchester City region, it is probably the single biggest uh, economic driver for the whole of the north of England and north, uh, north Midlands. And uh, yesterday we were talking about transport, talking about high speed two, talking about uh, northern powerhouse uh, rail, that for a lot of the north of England and for a lot of the Midlands, it's not about being able to get to Manchester, it's about being able to get through Manchester and to, in particular, to Manchester uh, Airport. For Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield Hall, uh, Newcastle, Tees Valley and so on, that's the, the real target for them about how they can access what is the international gateway to the whole of the, whole of the north of England. Um, the importance of uh, uh, aviation, I, I think, is, is very, very uh, clear. I'm going to say one thing uh, that is, I think, more locally related to uh, Manchester Airport, which is it is also a generator of uh, jobs. The airport itself uh, probably, on, uh, probably only employs a couple of th only a couple of thousand is, is not a particularly small uh, number, but the area around Manchester Airport, the airport itself, and the area surrounding is the third 
biggest job generator uh, in the whole of the Manchester uh, City re region. A very significant number of people working close to that site, which I think is uh, what Linda will be talking about, is how we grow that and gr how we grow that uh, uh, significantly. So, th I think that's me. Airports, uh, they're, they're important. They're important as uh, generators of growth. They're important for an area far, far wider than their own, own uh, uh, locality. You know, when we get to talk about Schiphol, Schiphol actually is an airport that carries out that role for a large chunk of Europe, never mind the immediate uh, um, municip municipality. Uh, we need aviation to grow, we need international connectivity, but then we need to think about how we use that international connectivity to create wealth and to create jobs. Great, Sir Richard, thank you very much indeed. And I think one of the unique things, of course, about Manchester Airport is the, the role that the city government has played in, in owning it and in shaping it. And uh, maybe later in the conversation, we'll also come back to that. So that set us up very well, the connectivity, the job generation, the importance of the airport uh, for the whole region. Let's move then to Stockholm. And Anna, very much uh, a big welcome to you. Thank you for coming to join us. Tell us a little bit about the role of the airport in the development of Stockholm and, and how you see your airport. Uh, I think it's also in, in the case of Stockholm has been crucial for uh, uh, both uh, creating new jobs, of course, as the biggest workplace in, in, St in the Stockholm region. And of course, situated far up in the north, it's uh, the connection to the rest of the world is uh, really important. So. Um, uh, and it's also connected to that we have a lot of regional headquarters uh, and the connection to the rest of the world and also getting more and more talents to, to the Stockholm region. So that's been a driver and it's, it's been a driver for the, actually the, the middle and the, and the uh, not maybe the south part of Sweden, but the rest of the Sweden, <laughs> of course. And have you more you want to say just about the, the development of the airport and explain uh, how you see the airport more generally in, uh, in the life of the city? Uh, of course, the airport city uh, around the airport uh, has increased a lot the, the last years. It's grown every year, uh, or the last three past years, uh, it's grown by 30%. So it's um, a lot of new companies and a lot of new uh, workplaces, of course. Great, thank you very much. So let's come back to the conversation with you shortly about the role of the airport in, in the future shape of the region, but thank you for, for telling us about that. Um, Oyvind, can you pick up the conversation and talk about the role of the airport in Oslo in the development of the city and the region? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think I would like to echo a lot what Anna just said about uh, the need to be connected. That's very, very important for a city like Oslo being a uh, on the outskirts of Europe, uh, uh, we need to be closer connected to the rest of the world. In 1998, we built a new airport outside Oslo, uh, 50 kilometers uh, north of, of the city. And we've been thinking a lot about how to, to uh, capitalize on that investment. How can we use that as a driving force for establishing new jobs uh, and also increasing connectivity? What we've seen is that we've had a very fast growth in the number of passengers through the airport, now about 26 million per year, from 14 million when we built the airport in, in 98. Uh, we also focused a lot on, on business development. Um, what we've seen is that uh, so far, uh, many of the jobs are connected to logistics, uh, hotels. Um, we also recently, just a month ago, opened up uh, a new hospital that serves the whole country, whole Norway. Um, so the airport now uh, and the jobs there are uh, perhaps mostly connected to uh, the connections to the rest of Norway and, and to, to uh, the export of fish uh, and the import of goods from the, the whole world. Um, the connectivity to the city is of course also very important. We very quickly uh, decided that we had needed to have a uh, uh, a rapid uh, high-speed train from the city to the airport connecting those two. Uh, but the distance, at least in the, 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 men the mental distance, the, the psychological distance between the airport and the city is a little bit too, too far, really, to, to, um, to use the airport as a place for locating headquarters and those types of things. They still prefer to be downtown in the city center. 
And we've looked at other airports internationally and uh, looked at how, what is the mix of jobs at different airports, at different airport cities. And we've seen that uh, the proximity between the airport and the city is really crucial when it comes to what type of jobs you can create. We, for instance, looked at uh, Vanta Airport near Helsinki, which I think is a good example of the airport actually being an, ex an extension of the city center. And they've really been very successful in, in locating high-skilled jobs, uh, head offices, and so forth. Uh, we're also trying to, to get there. Um, just recently opened uh, what will be Norway's largest business park around the airport. But what our experience is that we, it, it takes some time to really uh, develop the, the business side of the airport. Great. Ivy, thank you very much indeed. Uh, just tell us for a minute, I mean, certainly for people who live in the UK, where so, which some of this audience will come from, the emergence of Norwegian airlines has been quite a, an observable trend. How has that connected with Oslo Airport? Because I assume Oslo is their main hub. Absolutely. It's really been a driver, in the, especially in the number of passengers. Mm. Uh, Norwegian Airlines, which uh, of course operates out of uh, Oslo, um, and uh, it also has also meant uh, a large increase in the number of direct flights globally, mm. uh, which has also improved the, the connectivity globally. So that's been very important. Uh, um, but uh, I also think that uh, uh, what's special in, in the Norwegian case is that uh, the domestic uh, travel is also a very large part of the travel through the airport. About 40% uh, of the mm. traffic through the airport mm. is domestic travel. Mm. I think that stands out uh, mm. a little bit different from, from most uh, airports uh, around uh, capital cities probably. So that's also a very important driving force in the, in the growth of the airport. Mm. Just before we move on, Anna, can we just come back to you for a minute? Because Oivin was saying that actually the, the distance of the airport in Oslo from the city centre required obviously the high-speed train, but it mitigated against much corporate presence at the airport, whereas you said actually the airport at Arlanda has become a strong focus for corporates. Just tell us a little bit more about how that's happened. Yeah, even though it's also 50 kilometers from the city center, <coughs> yeah. uh, it's actually requiring a lot of new office spaces and also like this just uh, and uh, like testing driving ranches and like that. So, and more and more um, uh, different kind of companies uh, which are not used to, to uh, actually establish around the airport. Mm. So mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a new scheme in that way. Right, so it's, it's, it's a new phenomenon for you. And, um, and I know that uh, obviously the, uh, the Stockholm airport is sort of halfway between <laughs> Stockholm, the city, and Uppsala, right. another city. So uh, is, there, is there a corridor dynamic beginning to develop there? Or how does the airport make Uppsala uh, more of a proposition? No, I think it's uh, like a corridor. Uh, yeah. And uh, every day, I think about 30,000 people are moving from Uppsala to Stockholm on the other way. So, yeah. so it's, a, it's a big... Uh, amount of people moving that way in that kind of corridor. So that, of course, uh, expand and increase the, the office spaces during around the airport city. Mm. I don't know how many people know the geography of, uh, of this part of Sweden, but what's quite observable is that the growth and development of the airport has enabled the connectivity of two cities that would otherwise have been very low. And uh, certainly when I've spoken to you and your colleagues in Stockholm, the idea is that the airport creates the capability for Uppsala to become really the second city uh, there. So that's very interesting. Adam, all of us, I think, have been to Schiphol Airport, and we marvel at the size, the scale, the speed, the connectivity. But tell us a little bit w about what it's like to host the great airport at Schiphol, and how has... Uh, Harlemir and indeed the Amsterdam metropolitan area uh, help to develop the airport? Um, yeah, I really would love, uh, I'm going to answer that question. Um, but this, the title of this uh, breakfast meeting is City Shaped by, City, Cities Shaped by Airport. And it's good to know, to give a good answer on that, to, to bring you back in history uh, over 200 years. And I have a long run, but uh, I, sure. I will. Um, not a very long run, but uh, I really would love to tell you this uh, story. Uh, Napoleon just left, and uh, the king, the new king of Holland, uh, Willem I, came, and uh, yeah, he was reigning the country as a as a king. 
And perhaps you know, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands used to be one nation. And in the 1830s, uh, the Belgians uh, decided to uh, pro proclaim their independence. So the first king of Holland, he was very upset by that. I need, he needed something to show his, uh, his might and his strength. And there was a lake in the, in near Amsterdam uh, called the Haarlemmer Lake. And uh, the Haarlemmer Lake, was the, the, they used to fish over there and it was used by transport. But on one hand, because we, as you know, if, you, if you've ever been in, into the Netherlands, there were a lot of winds and, and the, the, the lake was expanding and expanding. And at one day, during a storm, the water was uh, poking at the city gates of Amsterdam. Now at that time, the king decided, okay, we need to drain that lake. Um, and yeah, at that time, if a king says something, it, 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 it would be done. So the lake was drained, not by uh, windmills, as we used to uh, have in Holland, but by the biggest steam engines ever produced, by the English, by the way. Um, so in Manchester. Uh, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, some of those steam uh, pumping engines are, uh, still remain, but in a few years, in the 1850s, the lake was drained. And at that time, there was a, what, 180 square kilometers of new land near the city of Amsterdam. It was there. And the government at that time had no idea, no clue what to do with the new, the, the new land in, uh, in the heart of, the, of, of Holland at that time, or, or, the, or the Netherlands. So a lot of, perhaps you can imagine, a lot of people came to the new land. It was some sort of like a wild west. All those farmers did everything yeah, they would love to do because there was no police force, there was basically nothing. So it was completely flat. And at the yeah, beginning of the 1900s, aviation took off, so the government was looking for a spot somewhere near the city of Amsterdam where they can host uh, uh, airplanes. And in 1916, um, Schiphol Airport was founded. And perhaps you know uh, Schiphol is the name. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's from the old lake. Uh, Schiphol um, was, uh, it's on the eastern part of the lake, and because of the western winds at the eastern part of the lake, it was a very, yeah, a lot of ships were, uh, were, were sunk over there. So they called it the hell of ships, the hell of ships, and for, therefore it's named name of Schiphol. Uh, but at that time, uh, there was nothing. And aviation grew, the municipality grew as well. Mm. And we are, there, here, where we are here today, basically, it grew to 500,000 flight movements and over into up to 70 million passengers. And what happened is the next is, is the following: aviation grew, but the municipality grew as well. And it, nowadays, we are at standing point. Okay, housing is growing, business parks are growing, the airport is growing as well. And now we have a very big discussion: what to do with the future? Are we? able to accommodate the growth, but I totally agree. We need uh, aviation to grow in order to maintain our economical position. We have 325 direct flight connections from Schiphol Airport to the rest of the world. That means that a lot of businesses come to the Amsterdam area. They found it, they, they, they're founding uh, businesses. Therefore, there are a lot of business parks. Uh, there is a lot of economical growth and a lot, a lot of economical wealth due to the airport. And I am very confident if we are going to decrease the airport, if we're going to, let's say, uh, but, uh, for instance, uh, cut flights or whatever, it's going to be catastrophic for the Amsterdam area and for the, for the whole uh, of the Netherlands. Uh, therefore, we need to have a very good discussion. How are we able to accommodate the growth? Two ways. Growth of the airport, growth of the aviation, but also growth of the people who need to live near an airport. And if you look at the footprint of uh, the Amsterdam area, you see a very beautiful thing happen. Basically, the fact that we have a lot of space. Because if you, where you are flying, you're not able to live or to build. So therefore, housing is concentrating on a very specific spot, but in the flight path, it's open. So we are able to accommodate either <coughs> uh, housing and business parks, etc. and on the other hand, we're able to accommodate an airport with quality of life because, of course, airplanes uh, make some make, make noise, but we are able to uh, uh, accommodate the noise and some uh, uh, that way that you're able to live there in a good and quality, a uh, very quali qualitative way. Great. So, are you saying that? with the, the new uh, aeroplanes, the quieter ones, the cleaner ones that Sir Richard was referring to, you're actually now able to accommodate both the growth of the airport 
and the growth of the population, you do have an equation to do that? Or are you saying it's a constant tension between those things? It always will be a tension. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, the new um, uh, uh, innovative uh, things or techniques or who are uh, uh, airplanes are going to be uh, uh, set with, eh? the, uh, then making less noise, uh, less um, uh, less fuel, uh, more fuel efficient. But on the other hand, we, there are also techniques to build houses yeah. who are able to uh, adapt mm. the uh, the noise. So and uh, we ha we need to use those techniques mm. in order to grow aviation and to grow the uh, make the population grow as well by building housing. Thank you very much, Adam. So one, one final question. Um, how much will Schiphol grow in the next 10 years? Is that clear to you and at the City Council? Uh, is, is it obvious to you what the growth requirements are? That question nowadays is the main question, not only in the municipality of Amsterdam or Haarlem or Meer, yeah. but it's the main question in the whole uh, 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 political... It's the, it's the, 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 poli the political question on top of, of the Netherlands by itself. So the government is dealing, or tries to deal with that uh, question as well. Mm. Um, in my opinion, we are, <coughs> that's my opinion, we, are, we need to accommodate growth and we are able to accommodate the growth, mm. but there are some voices who are saying uh, 500,000 flight movements is uh, more than enough. Right, okay. Thank you very much. That sets the scene up very well. Ladies and gents, by the way, to let you know, there are plenty of seats near the front, not only in the famous front row here. We also have uh, a lot there. So we want you to be comfortable. If you'd like to come and take a seat, you're really welcome to do so. Now, Linda, the story of Airport City is one that um, has been told, uh, and many people in the UK have marvelled at the, the pace, the scale, the ambition of the growth of Manchester Airport. Firstly, tell us all about that, but tell us um, what you think is needed to you know, go further and indeed increase the impact uh, of the developments around the airport. Okay, so, um, so my day job is probably um, developing, I think, one of the best sites in the UK. Um, we're in immediate proximity to an airport that is actually only between 10 and 15 minutes away from the centre of Manchester by train. So connectivity for us in terms of place and location um, is absolutely fantastic. And if you add that to the fact that Manchester is the 15th best connected airport in the world in terms of the routes that we serve and the point-to-point -point destinations that we fly to, it actually starts to present quite a unique dynamic when you're developing on the scale that, that we're, we're developing on. Um, so two things bear in mind. One thing is while I'm bringing forward this major development in uh, immediately adjacent to the airport, the group itself is investing um, a billion over the next decade to future-proof our, our airport um, and actually renew facilities. So we're carrying about 27 million passengers a year, but we've actually got capacity to carry 55. Mm. And in order to do that, you've got two major infrastructure projects going along alongside each other right now, um, which is why, you know, if you come to Manchester, you'll see um, airport, you'll see cranes everywhere. Um, my project is effectively to build 5 million square feet of space. Um, strategy was conceived just over five years ago, um, and we started with a combination of, well, we initially with logistics. Um, market for logistics in the UK, as it is elsewhere in Europe, is incredibly hot. But the demand for logistics in a, at an airport in terms of cargo and, and freight movements, and also companies that want to be located there because actually they're not just moving stuff by road, they're moving stuff by air. Um, is really important. Um, so Airport City South, um, you know, anchored by DHL and Amazon, created 3,000 new jobs um, at the airport. The airport campus itself employs about 22,500 already, so we've added um, in the last couple of years another 3,000 jobs. Um, that will continue to be developed out, 1.2 million square feet in total um, over the next couple of years. But we've really turned our attention to Airport City North, which is a much harder challenge, actually. I mean, just listening to sort of um, what, what some of the other panellists have said, because this is about actually create, creating a new commercial district on the edge of the city. So actually, I'm, you know, that is what we're building. We're building a new commercial district. And the overall ambition is actually that's going to add another eight to 10,000 jobs. Now, um, it's always slower when you're developing sort of offices than it is developing sheds. Um, but as, actually, as we move into 2018, 
We've got um, the first four new hotels are in the pipeline and we'll be on site with those later in the year. So as the airport grows, so does the demand for hotels, for, for businesses and, 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 and other passengers. Um, but actually, really excitingly, we're about to start the first um, phase of a 500,000 square foot occupier requirement, which will actually start to bring some another sort of significant new office presence to the airport. And actually, you know, by, by the time we've worked through this phase, we'll have added another 5,000 jobs to the city region. So it's very, yeah, it's really exciting. It's probably, like you say, it, it, it's, it's in a real sweet spot in terms of connectivity. But also we leverage not just off the growth of the airports and the fact that as we put routes onto China, as we put routes onto the west coast of the US, what you're seeing at the airport in terms of the types of businesses that are coming to cluster there are tech business, particularly with a focus on the retail sector. Um, you know, we've seen 800 jobs grow in our existing office stock in the last 12 months with companies like that coming in and actually locating at the airport. Uh, and also sort of kicking off, you know, sort of what's happening in the city centre on the back of the growth, you know, in, in routes to sort of places like the, um, the, the, the west coast of the US as well. Fantastic. And so uh, for people in the room who want to anticipate what's going to happen, let's say, over the next two to five years, what's the vision for how all of this will emerge with Airport City South maturing, Airport City North emerging and growing, the infrastructure gets completed? What does it look like when it's all done? Somewhere as this comes round, um, you, you'll, you'll see sort of the, the vision for this. But, but in essence, I mean, we're building sort of 80 to 90 new buildings. And it's a combination of hotels, offices, um, multi-storey car parks. So you've not got a massive amount of surface car parking when you're building as densely as we're building. But actually, the, the sort of wider vision is to create a really sort of connected and integrated community. So if you're building um, a, a, a place in the 21st century, it's not good enough to have big and shiny. You know, you have to have a way of actually making sure that the people that occupy those places that come to work here have a great experience. So a focus on well-being, a focus on health, a focus on connecting those communities to each other. But also, I'm building on the southern edge of the city. I'm building alongside what was historically one of the most deprived parts of the city and actually making sure that we're permeable um, to, to that local population, that jobs that we create are open to them, and that actually from a, an access and connectivity perspective that works. So the vision is, is much more than just throwing up sort of 90 new offices and hotels and the amenity. It's actually about creating a proper place, a place where people actually want to come and work. Because I spent 20 years of my career client side searching locations for businesses that I work for to actually sort of locate. And I can tell you now, you know, it's it, it's about the location, it's about the access to skills and talent. It's rarely, it's about connectivity and it's rarely about the cost. So when you're creating something like this, you've just got to create a, a fantastic place. Mm. Fantastic, Linda, thank you very much. It's really inspiring. Um, Adam, before we go to ask questions uh, uh, from the audience, I mean, you have experience at Schiphol of seeking to develop a kind of airport city with Zuidas and all the developments around there with the offices and mm -hmm. the residential developments. Have there been any, any particular lessons from that experience that you think are relevant to share? Um, in my opinion, you always try and need to find uh, the ecosystem which, is w which works. Uh, in my opinion, an airport city is far more than just a, a runway, uh, a terminal building and some office spaces. Mm. It's uh, the ecosystem by the retail shops, but also the housing, etc. And uh, we are able to have all of that uh, near an airport. And that's why I'm confident to say that we are really an airport city. Uh, we are able to live with an airport and the airport is able to live with the local community. So if you are trying to expand, yeah, please keep an eye on the that the ecosystem mm. still will work uh, uh, after that, and not that you that you're only building office buildings or, or only building houses or only building retail uh, uh, shops or whatever. But try to uh, to to get the best ecosystem working with the airport and, and all the other functions combined. I mean that's very helpful, and that sounds like exactly what you're doing, Linda. And uh, you said very clearly um, a few minutes ago that you know the, the development around the airport is connected to the city centre. I'm assuming there's been quite a lot of thought about what goes where, what needs to be in the city centre, what needs to be at the airport. Um, are there any uh, sort of 
obvious choices that have to be made about which businesses locate in which place? I mean, again, from my experience, to be honest, the occupier generally always chooses. So actually, the occupiers tend to choose the place that is that gives them the best access to the talent pool. Um, I think when you're talking about a distance of 10 to 15 minutes, it can be either or. But equally, what you're seeing is, in, not, in Manchester as well as in many other cities, is you're actually seeing businesses starting to cluster. So there will be logic, you know, in terms of the proximity to the universities will drive certain business to locate there. Proximity to our existing business financial services sort of district in the city will drive certain businesses to be there. What you find at the airport is you do have a mix of the above. So, you know, you, you, there are, there are um, a bank space there, for mm. example, because mm. it's an international bank. Mm. Um, the retailers that I've been talking about that are coming in are actually mm. international retailers. So they may well be Northwest businesses, but actually, you know, they are global in terms of their, their day to day business. We've got quite a number of US firms that are mm. based actually mm. at the airport today. Um, and, and that's all about export and import. Mm. But actually, also, we provide accommodation for airlines for many of the services companies that support mm. you know the aviation sort of sector itself mm. so so I think you know the the, the way business cl businesses cluster today you know there's a number of dynamics going on in yeah. cities that mean that actually you know some of the more traditional sort of models we've been used to in the last hundred years probably won't apply as you go forward into you know this, this hundred years. yes those old that old division of labor has kind of gone and as you say the client chooses so you could more or less see a similar profile of businesses it will yeah. just it, I think you said very clearly it's about access to the talent pool. That's the key thing for the businesses. And, and actually proximity to, you know, if you look at a modern workforce today, it's the proximity to a variety of places to live. You know, so again, if you if you think about being only 15 minutes from the centre of the city, you can mm. live in an apartment in the centre of the city, or you can live mm. in South Manchester, you know, in che or Cheshire. Actually, you know, sort of. It, we're quite dense in, in, in terms of sort of um, geography mm. and we're very well connected actually as a city. Great, thank you very much. Now, I want to open it up for questions uh, in the room. Before we do that, I just want to ask Sir, Sir Richard to make one comment because it is rather unique the way the city of Manchester itself has stewarded the airport. And do you want to, partly for our international visitors and partly for people in the room who don't know, would you say a little bit about how the shareholding has evolved and how your role as the principal shareholder has developed? Uh, well, if, if you go back to uh, the, the days of the old Greater Manchester uh, County Council, the airport then was divided between the city council half and the county council. We think the mic might have fallen down, Richard. Oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, so yes, um, the, 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 with the breakup of the uh, county council, the shareholding changed so that 55% was owned by the city council, 45%, 5% each for the nine other districts in Greater Manchester. So until relatively recently, uh, it was an entirely municipally owned uh, airport. And uh, about five uh, years ago, I'm, I'm not going to go through how the government's changed over time, uh, but uh, probably a little bit longer than five years ago, we tried to buy Gatwick uh, uh, Airport and we were uh, just pipped at the post for Gatwick uh, uh, Airport. But so uh, a little bit later, we thought we'd buy Stansted Airport uh, in, instead. Uh, it's a very, very simple business model, really. You buy a really badly run asset, run it well, and it, and it, 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 will, do, uh, it will do well. And Stansted was really badly, uh, uh, badly, uh, badly run. But uh, in order to do, do that, we looked at the, the best way of doing that and decided we wanted uh, an equity partner. Uh, in order to do that, we brought in uh, an infrastructure fund, IFM, as our equity partner, uh, and the shareholding changed. So now uh, it, it, it goes in 31st. So the city council owns 11 31st, IFM own 11 31st, and the other nine districts own 1 31st each. Uh, there is a reason why it ends up as 31st, but I won't go into that either. Uh, so, uh, but in terms of voting shares, it's a, a deadlock company. The city council have 50% of the voting shares. Uh, IFM have the other 50% of the uh, voting shares. So it basically operates on a consensus model between the two uh, shareholders. Uh, since that came into uh, operation, 
Uh, Stansted, which was actually declining at the time we bought it, is now up to around about 26 million passengers. It's just behind. Uh, Manchester has been growing very, very uh, rapidly. As Linda said, Manchester Airport itself has gone up uh, very rapidly uh, over the past five years to 27 million passengers and is still uh, expanding very, very rapidly. Uh, I think one of the strengths of Manchester Airport and its expansion is a lot of that expansion has been global long haul uh, routes and, and actually in terms of uh, uh, the economic impact, those direct flights uh, via the Middle East, you know, you've got to eight flights a day in, into the uh, em various parts of the Emirates uh, with onward connectivity, the direct flights to Hong Kong, Beijing, uh, Singapore, all, all, of, all of that and the United States uh, routes is what drives, drives the economy forward. But uh, certainly the importance of the city council ownership has been is that, yes, we want it to be economically successful in its own right. We quite like getting a dividend uh, from the airport, but it's also equally important to us that the airport grows as a driver of economic growth. So part of the strategy has always been how does Manchester Airport operate as a driver, not just for the city of Manchester, but for the whole of the north of England. Richard, thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's a real heroic story. In, in the British context where nearly all airports were privatised, the idea that a city government would remain the majority shareholder in an airport and would use it in this kind of way uh, is really very fascinating and I think has uh, uh, told a different and uh, shined a light on uh, how to run airports. Well, it's, it's a bit cleverer than that actually because uh, the government can't privatise Manchester Airport anymore because we've done it. Yes. it. So what we've been able to do is to... Uh, in legal sense, is privatise the airport, but still retain 50% control. Very clever. <laughs> Let's open it up for questions. We're talking about cities shaped by airports, the role of airport development, new aviation technologies, the, the new economic geography of airport zones, uh, what you can do at airports that you didn't used to be able to do. The floor's open. Who'd like to come into the discussion? Simon? Microphone's on its way. Uh, thank you. Um, airports are pretty expensive uh, to, um, to operate and to expand, uh, it seems to me. Um, and with the amount of growth that we're getting in, in, in airport passenger numbers, I wonder whether the panel can comment on whether or not airports can really keep up with, um, with that demand and still continue to offer the customer experience that, um, that we need uh, to ensure that we attract uh, people to our cities. Um, it's hugely expensive, it seems to me, to maintain and uh, grow uh, the infrastructure and everything that goes with it. Mm. Um, how, how do we make it uh, all pay? Okay, so how do we make the costs work and still provide the high quality experience in the context of growth? Interesting question. Let's see if there are other questions in the room before we get the panel to comment on that. We'd like to take a few if we can at this point. We've got one, two. Thank you. It's Sebastian Tibbenham from Pegasus Group. Um, it's for Richard and Linda, really, in relation to HS2 and the airport station there. Obviously, we've probably most of us have experienced the connectivity between Schiphol and its airport, and the current airport train station is well connected as well, but the HS2 station preferred location is some distance away, and I just wonder if there was any further thoughts on connectivity between the two. Great. That's a very clear question. Thank you very much. HS2 is high speed two. It's a new railway line. Uh, in, in England to begin with that goes uh, London, Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds and it will connect the airport. Alistair. Uh, morning Greg, uh, morning to the panel. Alistair Morrison from the Invest Glasgow team. Uh, we heard from Richard about the, the importance of ownership but to the three panel members that are not from Manchester, can I ask them how important as a fact that ownership of the airport is in terms of its growth and its relationship with the municipal authorities? Yeah, so how do the owners of Stockholm Oslo and Schiphol interact with the municipal entities? What's the nature of the partnership? How does that work? Very useful for us to know. Who else wants to come in? Okay, well, let's pick up those three questions. So there's a specific question to, to Richard and Linda about HS2, and then these two more general questions about can airports keep up with the growth, the cost, and the quality of the experience, and then what about the relationship with the municipal entities? So uh, maybe we'll ask our guests to start first. So, Anna, would you like to begin? Yes, of course. Um, 
has come to the ownership of Orlando. It's uh, owned by the government, and that has been good in one way, but also bad in another way because you you lack the flexibility and that. Uh, you mean the Swedish government. Yeah, yes, the Swedish yes. government. Yeah. Uh, and what's happened is that a couple of municipalities uh, uh, around the airport actually uh, worked really hard with new flight directions. So now it's over 200 direct flights from Orlando, mm. uh, and it's increasing a lot. So. Um, we worked on a partnership uh, with a couple of municipalities, the governmental level and also the, the uh, Visit Sweden and Business Sweden, and that's been really important to, to the group. Mm. Very good. And um, these municipalities, I guess, are part of your uh, Stockholm Business Alliance. That's right. So just tell us a little bit about that, because this is, this is the way you bring all of the municipalities onto the economic development agenda for the region. That's right. Uh, here in Mithim, we have uh, 55 municipalities who are invited to, to our uh, partnership. It's five year row, uh, and uh, we work with inward investment, mm. uh, business facilitation, and also marketing, of course. So that's one way to, to connect also with the airport issue. Mm. Mm. And what's your view of this other question that Simon put, uh, Anna, about whether as Arlanda grows as an airport, can it keep up with the costs whilst maintaining the high quality of customer experience at the same time as developing all of the new lines? Is there a challenge there in the business model? Of course there's a challenge uh, uh, there, but, but also Stockholm is known as the startup hub in the world, maybe, mm. Mm. <laughs> and a lot of tech companies. Uh, establishing and growing here. So I think that uh, the smarter solutions uh, and uh, um, more, of course, um, self-demand and also mm. doing more uh, when you're own traveling and like that. So I think that, that kind of smart solutions is, is one way to, to cope with the uh, increasing costs. Mm. Great. So the application of your smart technologies in the airport itself as a kind of improving the experience and uh, reducing cost. Wavin, will you pick this up then? So tell us a little bit about this from uh, the Oslo airport point of view. Well, like in Sweden, uh, the Oslo airport is owned by the national government and, and so is almost all of the airports in Norway. Mm. And really the Oslo airport is a money-making machine. Mm. Uh, and it, subs it creates uh, subsidies that uh, is used to maintain smaller airports all around Norway. Mm. Uh, and that also, of course, helps Oslo Airport because it means more uh, domestic routes. Mm. Um, uh, but we've seen a, 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 a very large growth in the number of passengers, uh, uh, really um, in terms of the, the customer experience, the traveler experience. Uh, the problem has been the, that the capacity of the airport has been too low. Mm. So just uh, a year ago, there was a, an ex uh, expansion of the airport with the new terminal, mm. uh, and that helps a lot. So now uh, we have at least uh, the capacity to, to take care of the passengers in a, in a good way. Mm. Um, so uh, it, it's really covering the cost. And also in terms of the regional dimension, I think also... Uh, the airport has proved to be very, very important in economic terms. Mm. Uh, we see that perhaps uh, most significantly in the, the growth in the, the municipality around the airport. We've had 2.5% annual growth of inhabitants in the, mm. in the nearest municipalities, um, creating a lot of jobs. And I would also s say that they're creating jobs that are very, very important mm. because uh, we've ha we have a very large... Uh, 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 demand for high-skilled jobs in the area, but uh, people without higher education also are looking for jobs, and they can find that at the, uh, the area around the Oslo airport. So actually, um, uh, the, the airport municipality is now the fifth most uh, uh, popular uh, uh, municipality for younger people mm. in Norway mm. because of the demand for uh, for jobs without higher education, but still well-paying jobs. Mm. And also have been uh, recruiting people from Sweden. A lot of Swedes also work at the airport, but close, quite close to the Swedish border. Uh, so it's really a, a money-making machine in that sense, both uh, um, for, for, the, for the airport system and also for, for the, the economy as a whole in the region. It's a very important comment, actually, because I, I know that for, for a lot of city regions around the world, the challenge is how do you build a second and a third center within your city region? And you're sort of saying the airport does that. But you're also saying the airport's a generator of sort of medium skill 
but, but well-paying jobs. And that's obviously a big quest for all of these city regions. So, so that, I think, is, is very interesting. Um, I know that you've had some challenges in Oslo getting the national government to understand that the capital city is important for the rest of the country. It sounds like the airport operates as a kind of metaphor for that. Is that right? Yeah, but the airport really understands, uh, the airport authorities really understands the connection between the capital city and the rest of the, the country. It's, you can read it in their, their budget, really, that connection. So they are very eager to, to, to uh, get a connection with the city, to cooperate with strengthening mm. the city brand of Oslo, for instance, mm. Mm. Uh, strengthening Oslo as a, uh, a, an, a, an attractive place for talent and investment. Yeah. So we have a common uh, interest in that, but also connects to the national interest. Mm. So I think I rather uh, I would say that uh, in spite of the, the normal uh, tension that we have between the national government and the city government, uh, when it comes to the airport, that's not the case in the, in the same way, actually. Very interesting. Um, Adam, will you pick up the theme? Can, can Schiphol adopt all of this growth and still maintain the right quality experience and still be um, affordable? And, yeah. and how does the ownership interact with you at the city? Now, let us start with the last question. Uh, Schiphol is, an, is a private company. But all the shares, or let's say 92 of the, of, of the shares, are uh, in hands of, of, of government parties. 70% the national government, 20% the uh, city of Amsterdam, 2% the city of Rotterdam, and 8% is uh, by Aeroport de Paris. And they have a share of, uh, Schiphol has a share of 8% in Aeroport de Paris as well, has to, uh, because of the Air France KLM uh, joint venture. Um, there are basically three answers to your question. Um, yes, the Schiphol Airport can accommodate growth. We have six runways, so if you uh, uh, put the schedule a little bit uh, on the right side, you can accommodate 800,000 fly flight movement. But on the other hand, you need to accommodate the passengers as well. Uh, and uh, we have 70 million passengers right now, and we, are, uh, uh, we, we need to expand. So that's why uh, Schiphol Airport is building a new terminal and a new pier as well to... Uh, to station their airlines. But on the other hand, that is the political question. Uh, if we are technically able to grow to 800,000 flight movements, is there the, uh, uh, the will of the, of, of the, the people to, to grow as well? And that discussion, we do that, and we, it's uh, world famous, uh, they say to me, in the so-called polar model. Uh, all the stakeholders put together and try to find a solution. And what I'm uh, entering uh, earlier on was uh, uh, the 500,000 right now. Uh, some people say it's enough. Other people uh, say, yeah, we need to grow. Um, but if we want to grow, then we need to answer the question as well, how are we able to grow? And how are we going to use the runways? Because nowadays, uh, because of the... the, uh, um, um, the afspraken... Uh, the, the, the agreements we've made with, uh, let's say, all the, pe oh, oh, the, 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 all the people in that polar model, um, it is that we are keeping the 500,000, and if we want to grow, how are we able uh, to grow? But because of the sound barriers, we are swifting runways 18 times a day, mm -hmm. and that is very, very complex. So if you want to accommodate more than 500,000, perhaps you need to swift more times a day than, those, than the 18. And why are we doing that? Because of the noise corridor and the agreements we've made with the people living in certain parts in the end of, of, of the runways. So technically, yes. Politically, I think we need to have some very big discussions if we are able to grow. But if we want to grow, first thing you need to do is to accommodate the passengers in a very good way. Uh, and that's why now are we already, of Schiphol is already uh, uh, building a new pier and a new terminal. Mm. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Are you literally saying that you swap the noise patterns between different locations so that different communities, as it were, suffer in rota? Yeah. That's literally what happens. Okay, very interesting. Um, Sir Richard and Linda, who's going to pick up which question? <coughs> Maybe if I, uh, I, I start and... Uh, start with Simon's question about the quality of uh, ex experience, that uh, as the existing terminal buildings in Manchester Airport have become full, uh, which they are, 
and in the case of T1 in particular, it is very much showing its age. Manchester Airport has not been able to provide the quality of experience that uh, passengers uh, expect or that we would like to offer, which is why we're rebuilding it, basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that billion pound investment that Linda talked about, in, uh, which is not just the terminal buildings, that's the aprons and everything else, which would enable us to grow to the full capacity of the two runways, uh, which is uh, where, where we need to get to, but also that those new terminal buildings will give a whole new passenger experience as well. So the only way you can maintain passenger experience as you grow is to invest. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, we are investing here in what is a very profitable asset as, as well. You have to put some of those profits back in in order to be able to uh, maintain the quality of experience. We were doing similar at Stansted, by the way, which is also the existing terminal building is full there, and we're looking at uh, investing around 400 million at uh, Stansted Air Airport for exactly the same reason. But we're doing a little bit more than that uh, as well, uh, is that the way that uh, people expect to travel is changing, uh, the way that aviation operates is changing, and one of the jobs of uh, MAGO, one of the divisions within the airport group, is to look at the entirety of the customer journey and to see how can we make that customer journey as easy and as stress-free as, as possible. Really, not just when people arrive at the airport, let's start from when somebody's leaving home or the office to when they get onto the plane. How can you make all, the whole of that, look at the whole of the experience and make it as easy as possible? And we're working on that to develop new ways of, uh, of, of doing that, because I think we recognize that quality of experience is really, really important. Um, Touch on the, the other question about uh, uh, connectivity between uh, High Speed 2 station, the Northern Powerhouse Rail Station and the airport. Yeah, the intention is that it's going to be the other side of the airfield from the terminal buildings. So uh, we are going to have to develop uh, uh, various forms of tra uh, transit between that station uh, and the airport terminal. Uh, that will include the light rail. The Met Metrolink will be extended, so the original loop that was intended to go on Metrolink uh, will be built, and that will only be clearly one stop between uh, between the station and the, the terminal buildings. We'll probably have to look at other, other forms of uh, transit to the terminal buildings as well, which clearly we've got time to do because it's not going to arrive until 2033, so we've got a bit of time to think about that. Mm. Great. Thank you very much, Sir Richard. Linda? I suppose just a, a couple of, um, of other observations, really. Um, you know, sort of, we've talked about the importance and, and some of the other panellists have uh, of airports in terms of the contribution to the local economy. Um, and Manchester Airport in particular, you know, is vital for the whole of the north, north economy. If we invest in the airport, which we need to do, as Richard said, because actually as it grows, it's not, you know, you need to make sure that airlines want to come there, that passengers want to come there. We carry 60% of business travellers from the north come through our airport. So actually it's really important that we continue to invest because that actually brings brings airlines in and actually supports inward investment into not just our city, but, but, the, whole, but the whole of the region. Um, from a rail perspective, um, investing in particular Northern Powerhouse Rail brings 10 million people into the catchment of Manchester Airport. And actually, statistically, the growth of Manchester Airport to 55 million is something like six, it's six times the benefit to the north and region than actually another runway at Heathrow or another runway at Gatwick. So for the whole of our northern economy and as part of you know, the wider industrial strategy of the UK, continuing to invest in the airport, continue to invest in surface access and transport links, you know, so it's actually pretty fundamental to support the growth and actually to support inward investment, um, to support the real estate as well as many other sectors. Great. Go on. In terms of Northern Powerhouse Rail in particular, just I think appreciating the difference it will make to Manchester Airport and the places served by Manchester Airport. Um, the most obvious example is, is that Northern Powerhouse Rail will give, give Liverpool to Manchester Airport 20 minutes. It will be easy, as easy to get to Manchester Airport from Liverpool as it would be from Manchester uh, city, city Centre. Uh, Leeds will be 35 minutes. The, the transformation of access will be absolutely phenomenal through that. Mm. Fantastic. We're coming sort of to the end. I've got a couple more questions, but just want to see if anyone else in the room is waiting to ask before we get into that. Anybody else with a question? Yes, sir. If we can get the microphone here, please, Richard, that would be great. 
And uh, I'll add my questions into this one as well. Anybody else waiting as well? Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, Professor Craybanks, Manchester Metropolitan University. So really see the uh, exciting expansion and it opens up uh, international markets for our students. You know, it's a big area we want to grow. Uh, just an observation, really, as we grow the airport, what about the, econ um, the environmental impacts and how yeah. we're going to deal with that, really, especially with our, our waste contract going, mm. going down the pan at the moment? Mm. Great. So uh, as the airports grow, what's the environmental effect? We'll ask everyone to comment on that. Let me ask you also two other questions for a quick comment. How is the mix of national carriers, low-cost airlines and other international entrants going to change over the next period of time? And are there any tensions in all of that? You know, is it, is it all about British Airways at Manchester and all about SAS in Stockholm and all about KLM? Or is it some other mix that we're going we're gonna to get? And then uh, a quick comment. What's the most surprising thing you think you'll be able to do at an airport over the next five to ten years? So we're commenting on the environment, the mix of airlines, and what the surprise might be. Linda, we'll start with you, if we may. The, 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 <laughs> these are quick comments just to, to get us uh, to 10 o'clock. I, I think from an environmental perspective, really simply, anybody that's actually sort of um, running an airport or any city region that actually has a major airport within it is hugely focused on it. And it's a number of dimensions, whether it is you know, sort of general pollution, noise pollution, you know, sort of and all that goes traffic, you know, sort of all that goes and congestion, all that goes with, around an airport. And we just work really hard, basically, to try to minimise the impacts. Planes are getting bigger, they're getting cleaner, they're getting quieter. So that's a, from a technology. Um, remind me of the next one. The next one, next oh, one is about the mix of airlines. Um, I think that's different from airport to airport and from country to country, if I'm really honest with you. So if you look at Stansted in our portfolio, you know, very much the home of Ryanair, about 80% of the flights are Ryanair. Um, if you look at Manchester, it's totally different. Many more international mm. long haul carriers, as well as a real mix of low cost carriers are based there. Um, Low-cost carriers today are nothing like they were a decade ago. They are serving major cities on a daily basis, often multiple times a day. So to me, you know, actually that diversity of carriers is really important from a consumer perspective. And I hope that continues. And then the final one is the most what surprising will surprise us? thing. Well, OK, so let's go. I think, um, I, I just think the speed in which driverless vehicles in particular are going to impact big campuses. Um, and I think it's probably, you know, we keep saying it might be 20 years away, it might be 30 years away. I think it will be sooner than that. Sooner than that at airports? At airports, yeah. Yeah, great. Adam. Um, the um, environmental uh, uh, thing is a very big thing. Uh, because if you look forward to, let's say, the year 2100, they say aviation will grow eight times uh, more than it is now. Mm. And we all agreed on the Paris Climate uh, Agreements. Um, so somehow it conflicts with each other. Mm. And therefore, uh, it's, it's up to the aviation industry to find a solution on that as well. Mm. And hopefully, the most surprising thing is electrical flights, uh, uh, electrical planes okay. uh, uh, somewhere in the near future. And I really hope that it could be possible. Nowadays, they say the batteries are uh, that heavy that you're not able to, uh, to, to, to lift off. But still, hopefully, innovation and technology will uh, expand rapidly. And uh, therefore, uh, we are able, the aviation industry is able to uh, build an electrical plane. Mm. Um, and my answer to the question about how the mix. The, the the mix, mix um, yeah, what, what I've mentioned earlier is uh, Schiphol has thru, 325 direct flight connections, uh, basically all done by KLM and our Sky Team partners. Uh, that's a 70, 75 uh, percent. And it's very important for uh, Amsterdam in its region to maintain those direct flight connections. Mm. If KLM, for instance, uh, uh, decided to stop with, uh, with, with uh, providing those direct flight connections, that means that uh, international businesses are less interested in uh, establish their companies in the, in the Netherlands because 70 million passengers is far more far more than let's say the 4 million people who are living in the Amsterdam area so the we need that hub and spoke system of KLM and apart in, in, in the, the, the uh, and the partners of KLM sky team to maintain our uh, current position uh, and what you see is, uh, let's say, the full freighters, the cargo, uh, is decreasing because a lot of go, a lot of goes in, in, in the belly. 
Um, and what we are discussing right now are the, let's say, the holiday flights, the flights to uh, Turkey and uh, Spain, etc. Uh, do we want to accommodate them on uh, Amsterdam Airport, or are we, and that's what we try to do, uh, uh, push them to other regional airports? So uh, if we keep the gap, the gap of 500,000, uh, we can uh, trade, let's say, a holiday flight for a, uh, let's say, international, intercontinental flight. Great. So you're going to prioritize Sky Team, as it were, business relevant travel. That's going to be your core business. And to maintain the, interne the, the tw 325 direct flight connections. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oyvind. Environment is extremely important uh, for the Oslo airport. Uh, from the start, uh, we had a goal that very high percentage of the transport to and from the airport should be by public transport, and we have now uh, we are now one of the airports in the in Europe with the highest percentage of public transport mm. to and from the airport. Uh, and uh, what is perhaps even more uh, significant is that the airport itself produces uh, biofuel mm. for planes mm. and uh, all planes that are fueled at Oslo Airport, they have a percentage of biofuel in the mm. air fuel uh, and they are all the time now increasing the, uh, the percentage in dialogue with the carriers uh, with a large acceptance of that. Uh, and they're also now looking very um, aggressively at uh, introducing electric planes mm. as the next stage. So I think that that's a very important uh, issue. Uh, um, about the mix of carriers, I think we've seen, uh, like probably uh, all of Europe, uh, 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 a change in the direction of more low-cost flights mm. having a bigger percentage. I don't know if that will keep on uh, uh, going that direction. I think perhaps some people uh, get a little bit dissatisfied over time with the lowest cost uh, flights. Uh, so maybe the medium uh, priced flights will mm. be the most important uh, mm. in years to come. Mm. The most surprising thing, um, I think we, if you go to MIPIM uh, this year, you'll hear, hear a lot of talk about retail and the changes going on in retail. Uh, just last year, we had 110% increase in the air freight mm. uh, imports to, to Norway, and that's largely uh, due to uh, online uh, shopping. Mm. And I think the airport's role in, in, uh, in shopping and retail mm. sh should not be uh, underestimated. And I think we are, we've uh, seen a lot of growth already, but I think that that uh, change will continue in the years to come. So really for air freight, uh, mm. just on time uh, uh, deliveries, I think the airports will be even more important than they are now. Great, so air freights, retail logistics, a key growth area. Thank you very much. Anna. Yes, uh, the sustainability work in Ireland has been important for many years. Uh, Ireland was one of the first uh, airports uh, triple ranked uh, for their system sustainability work. Mm. Uh, and of course, in uh, the same way in Oslo, they are producing biofuels, but they are, it's a little bit uh, too expensive uh, today, so hope, hopefully the government will do something about it. Mm. Uh, SAS have been doing uh, greening flights for many years at Arlanda. Mm. Um, when it comes to um, the development between air... Uh, the mix? Yeah, the mix. Uh, even though we have the head, regional headquarter of SAS in Stockholm, we actually don't see SAS as our national carrier. Mm. Uh, the last five years, uh, it's actually Norwegian Airlines uh, who is uh, expanding most in Sweden. And um, we recently got Air India, China East, and Singapore Airlines. We work a lot with the international mm. companies, mm. Uh, establish new flight directs. Um, so uh, I think that um, what Norwegian actually has done in Stockholm and, and on other cities also is that they forced uh, more uh, historical companies to fly from point to point and not via a hub. So mm. that's a new mm. uh, kind of um, mm. way to, to, to work with uh, air directions. Um, and uh, if you come to Arland and the airport city in five years, I think you see a soccer arena. Mm. Um, in the a what? A soccer arena. A soccer, arena. Okay, yes. soccer stadium, yes. right, okay. Uh, yeah. I think that uh, one way is to have people staying at the airport and in the airport city for a long time. Yeah. And the soccer arena can be one of those things. Great. Which team will play there? Our national team, maybe. Ah, and great. Other national teams from other countries, maybe. Great. OK, Training. so could be England versus Sweden at Stockholm Airport. Yeah. Right. OK, great. 
Sir Richard. Well, maybe City Football Group will have a team there as well. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, um, uh, in, in terms of mix of airlines, I think what we are seeing is a certain amount of convergence that, uh, uh, by and large, low-cost carriers and full-service carriers are slowly meeting in the middle. Mm. Certainly, if I go on a low-cost carrier, by the time I've booked a seat, uh, uh, my bag in and everything else, it's not low-cost uh, mm. uh, any, anymore, and I think we are seeing that convergence taking place. Uh, in terms of the environmental uh, issues, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm glad that gr uh, ground transport was raised because uh, I, I think we've, we've talked about the impact of airlines and uh, air, air aviation itself, but there, there really is a big issue about how people get to and from uh, airports, and it's particularly the case for Manchester Airport because it is an airport in the city rather than uh, mm. outside the, the city, and effectively public transport, clean transport mm. uh, to the airport is going to become increasingly important mm. as, as the airport grows. Mm. Uh, in terms of what we might see, and I'm not sure about fi uh, five years, uh, but certainly anybody who goes to a UK airport uh, uh, at the moment is met almost immediately by government's austerity measures because you have to queue for passport control because they don't employ enough staff uh, yeah. uh, anymore. Uh, at some point, uh, we won't be doing that at all. We will just be walking through uh, the airport. We'll be using facial recognition or mm. other, mm. Uh, other techniques. Mm. You won't have to stop at all. It will just be straight through. Mm. Thank you very much, Sir Richard. So, ladies and gents, let's go have a quick vote on this. We're going to think about uh, the, the, the most surprising thing you might do in an airport in the next five years. On the one hand, you might use an autonomous vehicle to get around the airport. You might fly in a fully electric plane. You might see the, the Swedish national team or any other national team playing at a, a football stadium there. You might see a huge growth in retail freight, or you might have no queues because everything will be digitally enabled. Who thinks it will be the autonomous vehicle? Okay. Who thinks it will be the electric plane? Who thinks the football match? Ah, what a shame. Who thinks it will be the massive growth of retail freight? Who thinks it will be the, the queueless system? Oh, Richard, I think you've won it there with the, the Cueless system. Ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure. Home audience. Yes, a home audience. <laughs> they know how to vote in Manchester. Yeah. Um, let's say thank you very much to everyone for participating in this debate. Sir Richard Lees, Linda Schiller, Anna Gisler, Oivin Satvet, Adam Elzakali. Thank you all very much indeed.